Well, good morning. I'd like you to turn, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. We're going to read the first eight verses, although we may get further than that. We want to consider the new Jerusalem, uh, our uh, eternal abode, where we're headed. And so beginning in verse one, I'm going to read to verse eight. It says this, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. And be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us. When it talks about the new heaven and the new earth, and then it talks about the the old order passing away, um, there, there has been some debate amongst Bible students. Some are absolutely adamant that actually... Uh, it'll just be a refurbished old earth. <laughs> uh, so uh, they're, they're just absolutely adamant that it's not going to be completely new, uh, but it's just going to be the old one refurbished. And I want to just kind of talk a little bit about that. I, I want to say that I, I personally believe that it will be completely new. And um, th there's reasons why I believe that, uh, even though people are, are very adamant the other way, um, let me just give you uh, some alternative thoughts. Uh, um, first of all, uh, when it talks about the word new here, uh, in terms of new heaven and new earth, the word is not merely a remade heaven. Uh, uh, that's not the thought at all in the word. Um, in, in fact, uh, it, it's the idea of, of something completely new. In fact, uh, one of the things that convinces me that it will be completely new is this. The Lord Jesus in Luke 21 and verse 33 made a statement, and this is what he said. He says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will never pass away. So, so the Lord told us that there's a time coming when as we look at it, that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word would live forever. And so I believe that that's what's in view here, that the old order of things will pass away. And uh, as a result of that, he will make all things new. Now, let's just look a little bit further. And the word new, because it, it has the idea of completely new in character. But look at Isaiah 65 just for a moment. I want you just to see another uh, word here that is very helpful in understanding this. And again, it's it's not something that to break fellowship over with people, but uh, men like uh, Sice in his commentary, oh, he's absolutely adamant uh, that it'll just be, uh, he kind of uses the idea of the flood, that it was the same world just being cleansed, and this old world is going to be cleansed with fire, and then it'll be new again. But Isaiah 65, 17, it's a very interesting verse. It says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Uh, by the way, that's a wonderful thing to, to for us to know that, because, uh, you know, it says uh, that in this new heavens and new earth, that um, there'll be no more tears. 
And when it says the former things shall not be remembered, uh, people sometimes say, well, you know, what if uh, I have loved ones that are not going to be there? But remember what it says, the former things shall not be remembered. We're not going to remember those things. We're going to be focused on where we are and what we're enjoying. And there will be no tears uh, that will be found in this new heaven and the new earth. But here's the, the point. When it says I create, uh, the word create there is the word bara in Hebrew, which means to create out of nothing. So it's very, it's like the original, uh, when God made the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1, uh, he created out of nothing. Ex nihilo is the idea. And certainly when he creates the new heavens, the new earth, again, it will be out of nothing. So it's not going to, it's not going to be a refurbishment, uh, but it's going to be altogether new. Not new, not just in time, but a fresh departure, very different, as we've already seen. Part of the, the evidence that it's very different, it says, uh, again, verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and then it says there was no more sea. And so, again, we, we've already thought a little bit about that, that uh, it, it's going to be very different. No more sea. Right now, 75% uh, of our earth is covered by water. And no more sea. Now, it's not going to be that there's an absence of water because we're going to see in chapter 22, verse 1, that uh, there's going to be water there, but not in the form of a sea. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Also in this chapter, uh, there's going to be fountains of living water uh, that will quench the thirst uh, of people. Uh, again, verse 6, he said to uh, chapter 21, he said to me, it's done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning of the end. I'll give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. So certainly not going to be a lack of water, but uh, certainly it's, there's not going to be any more sea. Now, again, we're going to try and get into the Jewish mind a little bit. And I just came across this inter interesting article about the sea, because when we think of the sea, it's kind of like, well, I'm looking forward to going down to Spanish Wells and walking on the beach. And we, we kind of like the sea, especially if there's palm trees and heat connected with it. We, we like those kind of things. But to the Jewish mind, the sea was a place of separation and evil. We've already seen in the book of Revelation, it was the source of the satanic beast uh, that came out of the sea. Chapter 13, verse 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. So it's got very negative connotations. It's also the place of the dead. Uh, we saw in chapter 20 of Revelation and verse 13, where it says the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And so lots of negative connotations. And so to the Jewish mind, it was a place of separation and evil. Uh, other places, it talks about the Gentile nations. And uh, it was associated with the heathen. They're like the troubled sea, Isaiah 57, verse 20. And so lots of negativity in terms of the sea, uh, as far as uh, the Jewish mind was concerned. And God says, there'll be no more sea. So then we read in verse 2, in I, John, saw. Now, this is really interesting because John has not referred to himself by name since chapter 1, verse 9, where he said, chapter 1, verse 9, I, John, who, al who also am your brother and companion in tribulation in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. And so that was the last time he mentioned his name. He mentions it again now, and you have to ask yourself why. And perhaps the idea is this, that the vision is so overwhelming that he feels it necessary uh, as a last act of uh, the apostolic company to give his personal affirmation of the vision. And he says, I, John, saw, I saw this, I, I witnessed this, just, just like I witnessed the Lord Jesus. Uh, I was doing a young men's Bible study last night on 1 John chapter 1, and, and he talks about uh, having seen the Lord Jesus and handled the word of life. And now he says, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, and then he describes it prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
So he sees this holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. God's eternal purpose for this city is going to be fulfilled in the eternal state. And so I want to just think about this city's mentioned elsewhere uh, in Scripture. And we want to look at a, a few references, Hebrews 12 and verse 22 where it, we read this, but you are come to Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. And some have said it's the city of hope. We're, we're not coming to that mount that quakes with fire and all the rest of it. Uh, we're coming to this city, which is the Jerusalem of hope, the, the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, Galatians 4. Uh, we read in verse 26 that it is the um, Jerusalem that, that is above. Galatians 4, verse 26, we read these words, but Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. So this is that Jerusalem which is above, the heavenly Jerusalem. And, of course, it's the place of our um citizenship uh philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 for our conversation our manner of life our citizenship is in heaven from whence also we look for the savior the lord jesus christ so this city it says it's prepared with the same kind of care taken in the adornment of her bride for her husband on her wedding day and so you get the idea that that uh, it's one of the most beautiful things that a person could ever see just like that day when you see your bride all beautifully attired ready for the for her wedding day uh, god is preparing this place and it is going to be spectacularly beautiful just like a bride prepared for her husband on her wedding day and of course the lord jesus remember he said i'm going to prepare a place for you and all the rest of it so what we're going to say is this it's it's going to be a beautiful place uh heaven is going to be more beautiful than anything that we could compare it with on this earth uh it's going to be prepared in a beautiful way and so he said this is how i would describe it like a bride ready for a husband and of course it's the city that the Old Testament saints looked for. Again, we go back to Hebrews 11. Lots of the the, the faith uh, chapter is connected with this. Hebrews 11, verse 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's the city we're talking about, a city that has foundations. We're going to look at those foundations as we proceed in this study. But it's a city prepared by God. What a beautiful idea that he is preparing this city. Uh, it's a city that has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Uh, Hebrews eleven sixteen. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath pre prepared, he hath prepared for them a city. So again, this is a place that God has prepared by God for them. Uh, chapter Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, we've already looked at it, but again, it's good to see it again. Uh, but you will come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly reduced Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. And then Hebrews 13, verse 14, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And so it's just good to be reminded, isn't it? That's the city we're looking for. We're we're right now, we're strangers and pilgrims. This is not our home. Uh, we're on our way through. We're, we're passing through. We're going somewhere else. Where are we going? Well, we're going to the heavenly city. We're going to the new Jerusalem. And so here we're going to learn some things about it. Now we have to say it's a literal city. But it's, he's not going to just emphasize the city, although he's going to describe it. He's going to describe its dimensions, he's going to describe its building materials. It is a literal city, but it's also a community because what's a city without people? And so there's an emphasis, too, on the community which resides within it. And we're going to find that it's not going to be isolation. 
Uh, it's not some kind of, uh, you know, sometimes people get this idea we're just going to be floating around on a cloud uh, playing a harp. Uh, that is not the idea. City, what's what's nice about city is that it's filled with community. And, uh, and so there's going to be community there, but it's not going to be like the cities of our day. It's going to be a community that's in perfect harmony. And so no isolation in view here. And so we want to ask, what is the identity of the community which lives in the city? Because man has never known a community that has been unmarred by sin. Adam and Eve in the garden, they knew a limited community, but it was very limited, wasn't it? Uh, there was just Adam and Eve and the Lord, and that was it. But this is a much larger community. Uh, it's it, After the fall, every community that came along was scarred and marred by sin. And you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that today. You go to our cities and you'll see how sin is scarring the whole landscape of much of our cities. But this is not going to be a city like that. It's going to be a community that will be undisturbed by sin. And what a community it will be. Uh, and so this new Jerusalem, uh, notice it's it's a holy city. Again, verse 2, I, John, saw the holy city, a place where holiness dominates the landscape, a, a, a sinless, pure community of righteousness, a holy city. So who will be there? Well, again, it's it's very clear uh, that it will include the church of the firstborn. And so um, we, we see, uh, again, uh, this, this emphasis in chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 22, uh, that we're coming to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jews, Jerusalem. There'll be an innumerable company of angels there. Uh, <clears throat> There, there will be uh, the the church will be there. The bride, in fact, he's gonna when when he says, um, uh, <clears throat> "I will sh look at verse nine." Uh, there came unto me. This is chapter twenty one, verse nine. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, "Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife." And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and so on and so forth. So what we can say is that this will be the eternal home of the bride. The city isn't the bride, but the city is where the bride lives. And so when he says, I'm going to uh, show you the bride, the lamb's wife, and then he says, he showed me this holy city. Well, he's not saying the bride is the city, but he's saying, look where she is now. <laughs> and isn't it amazing to think about that? But right now, the church, for the most part, in culture is marginalized. It, it's it, it, we're, we're, we're connected with a savior who's despised and rejected. And, and so we're not seen as part of the movers and shakers of society. But in this city, let me tell you, come and see where the bride is now. She's in this new Jerusalem. Also, uh, the saints of former dispensations will be there. Men like Abraham, who looked for this city, it would be most uh, unkind if the man who had been lived as a stranger and pilgrim all his life because he looked for that city, if he wasn't in that city. And I believe that Abraham will be there. Hebrews eleven ten. he looked for a city which has foundations who builder and maker is God. Uh, we saw again, verse 16, they desire a better country, a heavenly. And so we could say that the saints of the past dispensations will also be there. And so it'll be the community of the redeemed. It'll be all those who had their part in the first resurrection. Remember, we considered that in a previous study. They are going to be in that city. All the saints raised at the first resurrection. The bride of Christ certainly will enjoy a special place of honor in that city, but also Old Testament saints too. Notice too that um, in the first creation, um, it seems that God prepared 
the place first, and then he made a people. In this context, what God has done is he's prepared a people first, and now he's he's revealing the place that he has prepared for them. He is bringing it to, for them to see. And so, uh, first of all, he makes us a new creation <laughs> through Christ, and then we're going, we're going to witness where the destiny of those who are part of this new creation uh, will experience, and it's going to be this city that is coming down from God. And again, as a bride prepared for a husband. And so verse 3, he says, I heard, Revelation 21, 3, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. So what's going to be significant about this city is it'll be a place where the presence of God is with men. Now we have a people of God among men, but in this city, all men are his people. He dwells with them and he is their God. And so he tells us this tabernacle of God with men, he will dwell with them. They shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. So we have God walking with man in Eden. Uh, we, we saw God dwelling among men in the tabernacle in the wilderness. We saw God dwelling among men in the temple. We saw the Lord Jesus dwelling among men. We saw the spirit dwelling in men in the church age. We saw Christ dwelling on earth in the millennium. And finally here, the presence of God is with men. And so what a wonder. And there won't be anybody hiding, getting as far away as possible like there was in the millennium. Uh, no, that city, uh, it'll be a place of conscious enjoyment of the presence of God and communion with God. He will be there. And then this city is, is known or distinguished by what isn't there. There's a lot of lovely things that are there. The bride's there. God is there. The Old Testament saints are there. But there are some things that will be absent from this city that are very present in cities today. So it's the New Jerusalem is distinguished by what it does not have. It doesn't have any tears. Notice he says, again, verse 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So let me just think a little bit about this. Um, it didn't have any tears. It didn't have any sorrow. It didn't have any pain. Uh, what's this idea of no more tears? All these things are associated with the old creation. They'll find no place here. Tears, death, sorrow, pain, banished forever. Things introduced in Genesis 3 through the fall and now finally done away with. And so the thought of there's no tears there, uh, it, it's not that God's wiping away all tears. He's not saying that, well, at first there'll be a few tears. You know, we'll be crying for people who are not there. All, no, that's not what it's saying. In a poetic way, he's simply saying there won't be any tears there. They'll all be gone. They'll be completely wiped away. All the sorrows of the past will be gone. They're finally done away with tears like those of David and Jeremiah and Paul and millions of other saints. Tears because of the havoc that sin has wrought, like those shed by the Lord Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus. The Lord became a man of sorrows to put a final end to sorrow. And it won't be there. His victory at the cross will finally put an end to sorrow. It says he'll wipe away all tears from their eyes. He says there'll be no more death. Truly, we are going to live eternally without death, eternal life in all of its fullness. No more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away it's done it's all behind us what what a no wonder in a sense we think of all the saints and they're on their deathbed and they're just looking forward 
to heaven. And I think as we get older, the pains, all these things are all preparing us to to, to get us ready for our new destination, uh, just getting us ready for that moment that we will be in his presence. And so we notice in verse um, 5, it says, He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And again, we just have this simple thought that I make all things new. This is the, the original creation, Genesis 1. Here is the complete new creation. I make all things new. The former things have passed away. And then he says, by the way, write it down. This is true. I mean, it's almost like it's too good to be true. It's hard for us to imagine, especially because there's so many tears in our day. Tears because of what even this very week, the mass shooting there. Uh, we have a brother on our prayer call. His family is from Lewiston, Maine. He had a, a cousin that would have been at that bowling alley, unsafe person, but circumstances, she didn't go. But but there's lots of tears there. We think of Gaza, the tears that are there. We think of Israel. The this world is filled with tears. Parents broken hearted over their wayward children. Uh, the, the sickness, the sorrow. I, we talked to my wife and I talked with a lady yesterday and she was telling us, that uh, we just we prayed with this lady. We met her in an office, and she was she was telling us that her daughter, forty eight years of age, throat cancer, going to have her voice box removed, and and she's already lost buried two children, and our only remaining child, forty eight. Listen, this world is filled with tears and sorrows and broken heartedness, but it's all going to be past. And so he tells us, he said unto me. Verse 6, it is done. We've seen that before, haven't we? Do you remember John 19, 30, when the Lord Jesus hung on that cross? And after those three hours of darkness, he says this, it is finished. We saw it in Revelation 16, verse 17, when God's wrath had kind of finished. It had been poured out on the world. And he said, it is done. Uh, Revelation 16, 17. And now for the last time, we will hear those words. It is done. And then he says this. He says to me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega. Because we know the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. Now, the metaphor of thirst is a common scriptural one to express earnest longings begotten through a sense of spiritual need and so we we have psalm 42 like has a, a heart pants after the water brook so my soul longeth after thee O god so we got that that picture this longing a sense of spiritual need and now we find that all these longings will be freely met whoever's thirsty let him come and drink the water of life freely from this fountain of the water to have it freely. So God's uh, statements recorded in verse five and six aptly summarize these final two chapters, really, of the book of Revelation. Behold, behold I make all things new. It is done. <laughs> and so what began in Genesis is brought to completion in the book of Revelation. And it's just, we just want to take a few minutes to just kind of do a little comparison between Genesis and Revelation. And so we found in Genesis 1 1, God creates initially the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here in Revelation 21 and verse 1, God creates new heavens and a new earth. In Genesis 1.16, God creates the sun. In fact, let's just, we'll, we'll take a, a minute to look at these references. Keep our fingers in Revelation 21 and 22, and we're just going to see the, the contrast. Uh, so <clears throat> Revelation 1.16, it says, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So he makes the original solar system, 
here in verse 16, but in Revelation 21, it tells us in verse 23, it says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. So that's verse 22, sorry, verse 21. Am I looking at the right reference here? Oh, there, verse 23. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So that which is so essential to our particular solar system and our universe, the sun, is no longer needed in the new heavens and the new earth. No more sun. In fact, is the glory of God provides the necessary light for life to survive and continue. So no need of the sun. Uh, we saw in chapter 1 of Genesis and verse 5 uh, that there's the establishment of day and night. And so God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. When we look at Revelation chapter 22 and verse 5, it says there shall be no night there. I just wonder, we'll maybe think about this and discuss it when we get there, but does that mean that we don't need to rest? <laughs> does that mean that we we won't have to uh, sleep? No night there. Uh, there's no night, because night often in our world, when there, there's many acts of evil done in the night hours, no night there. The night was established, no night in the new creation. We already saw uh, that there's no more sea in chapter 1, verse 10. It says, God called the dry land earth and the gathering together the waters called the seas. But we've already seen in 21 verse 1, no more sea. Also, the curse is enters in in Genesis 3 and verse 14 onwards. And so he says, the Lord God said to the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. And we read on uh, that the, the curse is mentioned all the way through verse 17. Uh, so the curse enters into the world. And so uh, when we look at Revelation 22 and verse 3, we read, and there shall be no more curse. So every effect of the curse completely removed in this new heaven and the new earth. Genesis 3.19, death enters in. It says, In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And so death, a very real part of this old creation. But when we look at the new creation, Revelation 21 verse 4, it says, No more death. Uh, Genesis 3.24, man is driven from the tree of life. And it tells us clearly, he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden a cherubim and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Access to the tree of life was forbidden to man. But now, not only is the tree of life available to man, he's restored to paradise conditions chapter 22 and verse 14 uh, it says um blessed are they that do his commandments and they that they may have the right to the tree of life and may to may enter in through the gates into the city and so there's this wonderful access man restored to paradise he can come in uh, there's no cherubim guarding the way he can enjoy uh, the tree of life freely. Sorrow and pain began in Genesis 3, verse 17. To Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of your life. So sorrow, pain, and again, chapter 21, verse 4, we see, in this new created order of things, it says, No more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be any more pain. The former things have passed away. And so what a marvelous, marvelous work God has done through the person of his son, the Lord Jesus, in making 
all things new. Not only does it mean that everything will be made new, but presumably it means everything will stay new. Right now, there's what's called the law of entropy, uh, where you know things basically left to themselves wear out. <laughs> Some of us are finding that our bodies are beginning to wear out. That won't be there anymore. It'll be repealed. Nothing will wear out or decay. No one will age or atrophy anymore. Such will be the conditions in this new heaven, in this new earth. And then verse 7, he says, uh, he that overcometh, this is back in 21, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And so this is the marvelous inheritance that has been won for us through the Lord Jesus. Remember in John's writing, the overcomer is the one who believes that Jesus is, is the Messiah. It's, it's, it's the one who's a true believer. Uh, they've overcome the current unbelief of their day. Now they now find themselves to be sons and heirs. That's interesting. This is very significant because it's the first time in all of John's writings that he actually uses the term son. Usually in John's writing, he uses the word technon, which means children, my little children. Uh, and so he, he's constantly referring to the children of God. But now, uh, for the first time, he says, this is going to be our new status. We're going to find ourselves in this new Jerusalem, and we are going to be both sons and heirs of God, all through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is this is our destiny. This is our future. This is our heritage. Now, when you contrast that in verse 8, he wants us just to be reminded again that not everybody is going to enjoy these things. Yeah, the overcomers, those that believe. But what about those that do not believe? And so once again, we're reminded of the awful condition in eternity of those that do not accept the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And so one more time, he wants us to be re soberly reminded. And so uh, in verse 8, we have what I would call the prime candidates for the lake of fire. It's kind of a list of the kind of people that will end up in the lake of fire. What kind of people are these that end up there? Now, some of them, we, we read the description, we say, well, of course, we accept that. That's very fitting. But some of them may surprise us. And so he begins with an interesting word. Uh, so he says in verse 8, but the fearful. Fearful of what? Is it fear of man? I wonder if people who didn't come to Christ, some of them was out of fear. Uh, they, they fear of not being able to live the Christian life. Maybe they thought, well, I, I couldn't live up to that, so I'm not, I, I can't believe it. Or, or maybe it was fear of what they might be asked to give up, or I couldn't give that up for anyone. Or maybe it would be uh, fear of the unknown. I'm not sure how this is all going to work out. What I do know is my old life. I know that pretty well. Maybe it was fear of, of being wrong. But whatever it was, fear kept them from this bliss that he's just described. Fear destines them to an eternity in the lake of fire. And so it's a terrible thing, isn't it? To, and especially the fear of man. What will they think? What will my friends think of me? I'll be considered to be a fool. And, and what a tragedy that fear cost them so much. And so he says the fearful, and then he says the unbelieving. Again, we've, we've stressed over and over again in the word of God, without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So those who refuse to acknowledge the evidence, you see, it's not blind faith. The, the evidence is very substantial. 
even as we considered with these young men last night, First John, here's an eyewitness. He says, our hands have handled the word of life. We know this is true. He, he, the word did become flesh and dwelt amongst us. We actually, we heard him with our ears. In fact, his words are still ringing in our ears. We, we held him, uh, the word of life. And so the evidence is overwhelming. The evidence for the resurrection, the evidence for creation, the evidence for the flood, it's all out there. The unbelieving are those who, who, well, they believe lies. They believe the massive lies that our world is telling, and they don't believe the truth. Christianity is not blind faith, but rational, based on evidence clearly laid out. And sadly, some willingly believe a lie that is unproven and irrational rather than believing the truth. And that again, what tragedy, what cost for not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? And then he goes on, he says, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable. So so what kind of things are abominable abominable to God. What does he find to be an abomination? So much so that these people will be forever banished from his presence. And it's always good to let God have the final word in what he considers to be abominable. And so if we look at the book of Leviticus, um, and just a few things, there's a lot more we could mention, but I want to mention a few things that are considered to be perfectly acceptable by our society. But as far as God says, no, they're actually abominable. So he says in verse 22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. So that's something, an activity that would keep somebody from this eternal bliss and would confine them to the lake of fire. Of course, unless they repent and believe the gospel. Book of Proverbs, chapter 11. Book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verse 1. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Now, that's a kind of surprising thing, but people that actually uh, are corrupt in their business dealings, that's an abomination to God. And again, there'll be plenty of corrupt businessmen <laughs> who uh, are lying to us, deceiving us, uh, not giving us what we're supposedly paying for, that will, again, unless they repent and believe the gospel, will be part of this company who will be in the lake of fire. Proverbs 16 and verse 5. Again, we read another thing that is an abomination. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And again, pride is a terrible thing that keeps people from accepting the gospel because it's a humbling thing to admit that I'm wrong, that I can't save myself, that I need a savior. And man doesn't like to admit need. And so pride is an abomination because how many people are being kept out of heaven because they're too proud to humble themselves and admit that I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Oh, what a terrible thing these abominable things are. And of course, murderers, we would expect that, I suppose. But the Lord Jesus goes a little bit further, doesn't he? In Matthew 5, we don't have to turn there. We know it well in verse 21 and 22. If you look on a on uh, somebody in, in, or, or angry with somebody in your heart, you've committed murder. And the, how many of us, uh, maybe with siblings or friends, we've said, I'm going to kill you. And God takes it seriously. And so uh, he says, you've heard that it was said of them of all time, thou shalt not kill. Whoever shall kill will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And so again, the murderer, the whoremonger, that means the sexually immoral person. Plenty of that going on in the culture we find ourselves in. Again, people who find satisfaction in other ways outside of God. The sorcerers, that's interesting. It's the word again. We've been hearing a lot about it, pharmacos. And it's connected with drugs. Uh, interesting that in, in the new eternal state, there'll be no drug dealers, either prescription 
or illegal. <laughs> and of course, why why pharmacia? Why is that this farm? Pharma- why is it such a, an, a terrible thing? Because it's what opens the door to the spirit world. Drugs have always been a means of connection with the the world of evil spirits. And so this idea of sorcery, uh, it's always connected with that. And so that will not be present in the new heavens and the new earth, but those that practice these things, well, they will find their place in the lake of fire. Idolaters, those that, well, there'll be no competition for allegiance to the Lord in the new heavens and the new earth. But right now there's a lot of competition. And a lot of people have got their idols. John would tell us the end of his epistle, my little children, keep yourself from idols. And then liars who themselves were subject to the lie. But again, we've often heard it said, how many lies do you have to tell in order to be a liar? Well, it's just one. And so it tells us this terrible list. It says... These that are prime candidates for the lake of fire, unless they repent and believe the gospel, unless they turn from sin and say, Lord, I need a savior. These people, it says, the end of verse eight, it says, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So again, very so even in the midst of all this glorious revelation of the, the new Jerusalem, there's still this warning note. Make sure you're going to be there. Make sure you're not going to be in this other place. Make sure that you're not one of these, that maybe fear is keeping you from Christ. And then I want you to notice, please, now as we go into verse 9, and I thought we'd get further than the first eight verses, so I'm thankful for that. It says, There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Now, maybe something that we need to consider here for a moment. Again, there are many uh, able expositors who now believe we go back to the millennial kingdom. And they have this idea that this city, the New Jerusalem, is going to suspend over the millennial earth. And um, that that's where we're going to be during the millennium and then of course going into eternity and so they believe that it will be the the administrative capital of the millennial kingdom now why do they say that well they base it on a couple of things verse 24 of this passage talks about the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it and then another verse uh, that uh, particularly makes them think this way is 22 verse 2. It says, in the midst of it, the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So that the idea is uh, in the millennium, you know, the nations will be, maybe there'll be a need of healing because of the, devastation of the tribulation that they've witnessed and so they'll have access to it and so those are the ideas that the idea of the nations coming to it now let me just say this um, first of all i believe that first corinthians 10 32 where paul talks about three types of people that god looks at when he considers the world and so he says give non offense neither to the jews nor to the gentiles nor to the church of God. I believe that these three groupings continue into eternity. So for instance, the bride will always be the bride. The church will always be distinct throughout the whole of eternity, not just the millennium, but throughout eternity. Israel will still be Israel even in the millennial kingdom. We'll we'll see this as we go through. I believe that they're going to be um, those that are part of the first resurrection will be in the heavenly city, but those that have come through the millennial kingdom, I believe that they will surround the heavenly city and they will be just like, remember the tribes of Israel in the wilderness, how they surrounded the tabernacle and they were on each side. They're going to be administering outside and then the nations 
uh, again, that go through the tribulation, that don't, not part of this rebellion, I mean, go through the millennium, not part of this rebellion, they will continue, uh, of course, uh, in a in a resurrected body, but they will continue throughout all eternity um, as to exist as nations. These designations will continue. So wh- why do we reject this idea of going backwards to the millennial kingdom in verse 9? And, I, and again, I want to just say that I, I really believe the answer is this, that that these this, we're in a sequence of 10 visions that we've already said begin with I saw, that begin in chapter 19, verse 11, and they continue on without pause right the way through until we, uh, 21, verse 22, where he says, I saw no temple therein. So it just is like a sequence, and we're always moving forward in this sequence. There's no thought of going backwards. John is speaking without interruption throughout the entire passage. He's amplifying details of the new heavens and the new earth, and in particular, the new Jerusalem in this section. When we look at the Old Testament prophets, they saw Jerusalem that now is as the administrative capital of the millennium. And and with a new temple, Uh, Ezekiel 40 through 48 describes that. This is going to be how the millennial kingdom will be administered, not by this new Jerusalem coming down out from God, but it will be the old Jerusalem that will be completely, in a sense, uh, the Lord's going to make some massive topological changes when he lands on Mount of Olives, and uh, it's definitely going to be different in design in the millennium, but he's going to reign from the millennial earth Uh, as opposed to this idea of this city coming down from God. Now, let's just go a little bit further. And I want to just make a a little bit of a contrast when we consider this uh, bride, the lamb's wife. So I want you just to notice something, uh, and this will bring our thoughts to a conclusion this morning. But let's go back to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 40, where we get this introduction to what he sees will be the administrative capital of uh, the millennial earth. And so in Ezekiel 40 and verse 2, we read this, In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was the frame of a city on the south. And so he's taken to a very high mountain to see all of the dimensions of the millennial temple and the millennial city, and he gets a vision. But where does he see it from? Well, it's from a great high mountain. Now, in Revelation 20, verse 9, uh, again, he he is going to do the same thing. Uh, Verse verse 10, notice, he carried me away, this is 21.10, in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So again, we see he's seeing the holy Jerusalem. And where's his vantage point? A great and high mountain. So both the millennial city and the eternal city are viewed from a vantage point of a high mountain. Now, I want you to go back to the Revelation and chapter 17 and verse 1. Because we're seeing the bride, the lamb's wife in Revelation 21. But in Revelation 17, verse 1, it says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and taught with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. And notice verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And so what a contrast. The things that God has prepared, he shows uh, from the millennium and also the new heavens and the new earth, he shows from a high mountain vantage point. When it comes to the whore, uh, the, uh, the, the harlot of revelation, where does he see it? He sees it from a wilderness. So again, we've got the harlot linked with an ancient city, Babylon. You have the bride a new city 
eternal city, Jerusalem, just as in 21 verse 2, city is a real city and it's the home of the bride. And what he's saying is this, look where the bride is now. Many um, suffer reproach and rejection in this world for being part of the bride. But oh, what a contrast. To be part of the whore, well, it's a bit of a wilderness experience that results in destruction. To be part of the bride, oh, what a glorious destiny God has for his bride. And what we can look forward to. The time is gone. There's much more we want to learn about this New Jerusalem, this heavenly city, but it will have to wait till next week. But at least we can see we have a glorious future, something we can look forward to with anticipation. And especially because of what's not going to be there. What a wonderful thing. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying. But what's going to be there? Beloved, isn't it wonderful to think we'll be there? And even more so, he'll be there. Oh, what a day that's going to be. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.